Hello, everybody, and welcome to Punch Kick Choke Chat. Uh, if you've been watching any of our micro episodes, you know that it's not always uh, all four hosts on the on the call. And often it's been uh, since Asuino and I, and we've had since Copeland on, but you're going to see more of us doing these things together. And today it's it's Hanshi Legacy and I together. I'm here with my karate teacher, and this is going to be a great conversation. And in the micro topics, what we're starting to dig into is some of the historical figures in martial arts and our thoughts and opinions on them. And since the legacy is a wealth of knowledge and it comes to the karate lineage, he got me really engaged in that stuff. And so how are you doing today, Sensei? Everything good? I'm fine. How are you? I'm great. I love I'm very excited to be doing this with you today. Sensei. Yeah, me too. Yeah. So I guess uh I the first question I have for you, Sensei Legacy, is you know, we're talking about Matsumura, Sokan Bushi Matsumura today, the founder of Shoranru, which is the system that you teach me and you've been doing for over 50 years. Um, and the question I have for you is about Matsumura. <clears throat> when did he come onto your radar? Like, where were you in your training? Like, and when did you start getting geared up about the history of Shoranru rather than just the training and physicality? Well, I... Uh... You always heard about Matsumura. He's he is that figure that overshadows everyone else. Um, so I heard about him and Itosu in my youth, but I was I mostly focused in on um, Itosu because he was known for a great fighter, and uh, you know, and that's in our youth. That's that's what we're doing. Uh, so as I moved along in my martial arts career, I had several teachers, and when I got to Richard. Uh, when, I, uh, when my sensei, Benny Allen, passed away, I was sort of looking for a new direction. And uh, I was well-trained in the physical part of it. And then I thought to myself, you know, I should probably learn a little bit about the historical and the spiritual side of the martial arts. And uh, then I went, and, uh, I went seeking, and I found uh, Master Richard Kim, who was... The primary person to teach you the historical part and the spiritual part of the martial arts. So I, I trained with him for 10 years. And um, he had written a book called the, the Weaponless Warriors, which you should seek out and read. He's an exceptional writer because, you know, I, it's a little bit like Robin Hood, the way he writes his books and it's it's exciting and it's colorful and it's it's fun that it makes you want to read more and more and from him the value is is not replaceable he just had such a wide range of knowledge until he um you know we parted ways and he passed away it's interesting you say that stuff, Sensei, because um, I remember that's one of the two books that when I started as a white belt that you said, you know, I went to the University of Western Ontario, which is where you and I met. And coincidentally, I was going for history. That's the degree I was. And I remember you saying, you know, there's a lot of great history um, in martial arts. And you even said about read this book, Randy. And I just became so enamored when I, when you gave me that copy of the weaponless warrior and I started reading through it and then the <clears throat> man as well. Um, but Matsumura as a person, like just, I, there's always a magnetism about him. Um, for me, then that those books led to trying to read more and more. And then with the advent of the internet, like you know, digging in more and more and more and different teachers have little bits of information. So I've loved, I'm so grateful that you put me on that path of researching and looking deeply into the history. Um, I love it. So turning it, that love, I guess one of the things is maybe we could go back and forth a little bit. What is, when it comes to Matsumura, there's a lot of myths and stories and those stories have to be based on some reality is there any one or two stories that kind of stand out for you sensei that when you read them you're like this is so exciting and so interesting like yeah well i think maybe just for a second i'm i'm gonna let you know who we were talking about okay yes. we talked he was uh bushi sokan matsumura was born in 1809 um in 
Yamagawa village in Shuri, Okinawa, and he died in 1899 on steps near City Hall in Shuri, Japan. He was about five foot nine, and his um, his youth name was Inu Kyo, right? And his name was changed by um, an event that happened, which um, we can talk about. Okay. So where is it? Do you want me to go now? So Sensei, the one thing, you know, when you say those dates, you know, even in some of the books, the dates are are different. And yes, so when yeah. people are watching this, they're going to be saying, oh, that's not the date. This is the date. And the one thing I want to provide, um, people need to remember that in World War II, when Okinawa was bombed heavily, a lot of the records were burned and disappeared. And so a lot of this stuff is sometimes the best guess of the dates. Um, yeah, well, these dates are on his gravestone. That's right. That you, and, that you and I knelt in front of yeah. in Okinawa. So uh, you are right. There are many, many dates, but I just, I went with the most common and yeah. the one is great. So yeah, you got to stick with something, right? Like you can't yes. just keep moving it around. But um, yeah, so any, any of the stories of Matsumura, like I know I have some that I just, I never get tired of reading them. And in every right. book, when I read them, I always still get excited about them. Is there any... Are those for you? Well, the greatest story, of course, is when uh, he fought the bull. Um, because when he fought the bull and, def and defeated it, as you know, he was given the title Bushi by the Okinawan king. A lot of people take that lightly. And they sometimes call themselves Bushi, which means gentleman warrior or warrior, but they're using it um, as a common word. They're not using it as a title. Only he was called the Bushi. When you say Bushi to traditionalists, their minds are unlikely to go to Matsumura. So it um, the story starts where the emperor of Japan gave the king of Okinawa a prize bull. And because the taxes were getting high and uh, people had money problems and other problems, um, the king of Okinawa decided to have a festive season. So he he challenged Matsumura to fight his prize bull. Matsumura, is, as opposed to just being a physical fighter, he was an intelligent warrior. So uh, trying to figure out a way of not losing face, I mean, facing a lot of thousand pound animal or something to that effect. Um, he decided to visit the bull and he asked the guard if the guard of the bull, if he could um, visit the bull. And he asked him to leave. And when he left, he, he tied the bull's legs to the side of the stalls and uh, took wooden slivers or pins and stabbed him in the nose. Before doing that, he got dressed in all his fighting gear. And so the bull would get his scent and recognize him on site. Some people say he was stabbed in the nose. Some people say he was stabbed in different places. <laughs> well, more private places, we'll say. And he would, he visited him for a week every day before the fight. So on the day of the fight, he entered the ring with his gear on it. And everybody, uh, well, what happened actually first with the bull, came into the ring and he was pawing at the ground. When Matsumura walked in with all his gear, people started to cheer and a loud noise, you know, filled the, the arena. And when the bull looked up and saw Matsumura and um, got his scent, he turned in fear and ran away and jumped over the wall and disappeared somewhere into the city. So the king's jaw dropped. I couldn't believe what he had just seen. You know, his King Bull had just, on sight of Matsumura, had run away. So he decreed that he would be called Bushi. Uh, probably the greatest warrior. And only he should be. That is the title for eternity. Right. That's, that's what I'm 
like the great one or the rocket that's there can't yeah. be two. there can only be one right? yeah. Yeah, I agree. yeah that's right you can only be one rocket so, so the thing I really love about that story, Sensei, that you touched on is just how intelligent Matsumura was. Um, oftentimes, when I retell that story in, in the dojo to the students, you know, you'll get people who they'll go, oh, like, he was mean to the bull. He did this and he did that. And they, they focus on that. And then what I always try and do is explain historical context to them, right? Like, you have to think about the time. There was no internet then. There was no street lights. There was no police department. There was no automobiles. And you had to be a self-sufficient human being. And then I always ask the, them the question, well, what, what did you think would have been better? I said, had he not done that? And then the bull came in and maybe gored Matsumura to death or Matsumura drew his sword and cut his head off. And then the bull died. I said, the way that Matsumura did it, in the end, Matsumura was fine. And the bull was fine. The bull got to go away and do what bulls do. And Matsumura got to go away and do what Matsumura did. And everybody was fine. All because Matsumura was intelligent and thought it through um, the best path forward. You were with your sensei once, Benny Allen, right? I think that's... Oh, I always yeah. figure that, that. And... Maybe you might want to just mention that that little story before we go to the next topic. Um, well, we were driving uh, down the road one time. I was with my sensei, Benny Allen. And um, all of a sudden, the car stops. And it stops outside of a farm. And there's a Braemar bull <laughs> in, in the yard here in the, on, the, on the farm. And um, it was sort of like a wooden fence. And uh, he said, just a minute. So I rolled my window down. He walked across the front of the car down in the ditch and over to the fence. And he crawled in in the lower part of it between the two posts and started to walk slowly towards the bull. The bull turned around and faced him and started digging into the ground and took a couple of quick steps. He popped back out underneath the fence, ran through the ditch. He came around to the side and sat in the car. I don't give a hoot what anybody says. He says, Matsumura never fought a bull like that. I <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it was a wise decision. So yeah. But you know, since even that when they're like, oh, the bull wouldn't have been afraid, this then my response to that when people say that, that they think that's a myth, it didn't happen. And then I say, Well, did you ever go to the circus? Why does a tiger sit on a jump through a flaming hoop? when the guy points the whip and why does an elephant like stand on a thing and balance a ball because they were conditioned to do that. They didn't really want to do that. They were conditioned to do it. And so I, I believe that's one of the stories about Matsumura that is like 100% truthful. Like, and, yes, absolutely. Right. He chased case the bull down the road when it got away. He ran up beside it. He was except exceptionally strong grabbed it by the horns and took it to the ground just like you do in rodeos and right. until somebody tied his feet and then let him off then to uh safe area right yeah like when people say oh that i that can't happen i usually think well that's because you can't do it so that's why you think it can't happen but yeah. you know well, no they can't phantom what happened during the old days absolutely you know? not yeah. So, you know, let's say we should probably touch on the other famous story about Matsumura, which was when he uh, he engaged with Yanomini Saru and his mm -hmm. wife. And what happened there? And do you want to maybe, you know, and let's say as you're telling it, one thing to keep in mind is um, even though you and I have discussed this so many times, it would be good for some new white belt or somebody who's new to hear this maybe that can't read the weaponless warrior and hears us talking about it, they might get excited about it as well. So maybe if you want to dig in a little bit on the Yanomini Saru Matsumura yeah. background and story. In 1818, um, Matsumura married Yanomini Saru. And she came from a very prominent family in the martial arts. And the question always arose, I wonder who's better uh, Matsumura or Yanomini Shiru. And she was extremely talented. 
Um, so he, he was getting a bit concerned about that. So he thought to himself, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to disguise myself as a farmer and put grease all over my face. And when she's walking home some evening, I'm going to attack her. He was, it was his wife. So he, he didn't want to like harm her in any, any way. But that doesn't take away from the story. So anyway, he waited until she was about to uh, cross in front of him and he leapt out of the bush and yelled a scream at her, and which put her into a fighting mode. And she automatically jumped up in the air, threw a double kick at him and, a, and a, on landing on the ground, she hit him with a back fist and knocked him out. <laughs> so she uh, stripped him naked and tied him to a tree. Quite embarrassing, I, I would. We take. And um, after that, a little while after that, the palace guard who he was he was training came along and heard uh, him calling for help. And he was like stunned at seeing Matsumura tied to a tree naked. So being his boss, he told him never to say anything to anybody. Obviously, he did because we know of it, right? Uh, so he got dressed and went home. He didn't know what to do because he, he really didn't want to, you know, like punch her in the neck or do anything like, like that. So he, he, uh, he went to his sensei, Karate Sakugawa. And he said to her, look, I've just been embarrassed by my wife. She just, he told her what happened. He says, well, what I would suggest is that ever happen again, that you, you faint to her breasts. Women will go to extremes to protect their breasts. It's a, a vulnerable area. So he got, uh, got dressed up again and uh, he attacked her in a different place at a different time. And um, he did do that. He fainted a punch to her breasts, he pulled it. And while she went to cover up, he threw his arms around her and they both fell down. And he fell down on top of her and winded her. So he got up and ran away. I guess in his mind that uh, that evened things up and made him feel a bit better about himself. But uh, later on that night, she said to him, I knew that that was you. And I'm glad that you finally learned the lesson that an opponent is an opponent. At any time, somebody can defeat you. And uh, they went off into the history as probably the greatest couple of martial artists all time. Yeah, the the one thing, if you don't mind me adding in, Sensei, was in the beginning, Matsumura just kind of dismissed it all. But then when he was coming home that time, he, you know, many had left that one party and got attacked by three men and she had, she had knocked yep. them all out. And then when Matsumura saw them, and I think her Obi was there and he realized that that was her Obi. Yeah, she tied him, yeah. Yeah, he right away was like, oh, my God, my wife is this good. Like, she's as good as everybody's saying that she is. Yeah, she. Uh, I, I sort of was saving that for when we talk about her a little bit. But uh, again, three bandits were uh, decided to attack her at nighttime. I, I guess they had evil intents there. But, yeah, she was a wonderful kicker. She just jumped up, kicked one guy in the head, the other guy in the um, had a sigh. She kicked the other guy in the chest and then distanced herself, distanced herself and kicked the other guy in the crotch, went down. She hit him with a back kick or a side kick. Things were tough in those days, you know? <laughs> like, well, look, yeah. like I said, Sensei, right? Like people will say, oh, I'm supposed to believe she didn't know that that was her husband. And I always tell people, I'm like, yeah, but you're thinking about a light switch and a paved road and street lights and we're, what we're talking about is and you're thinking of walmart where you can go just but like you've got infinite amount of clothes matsumura didn't have infinite amount of clothes he probably had two or three or four pairs of clothing and then so if he borrowed other clothes and borrowed a hat and disguised himself and hid in a jungle path which is what we're talking about and then jumped out 
initially she's going to think that that's just another person trying to attack her. Like it's definitely a different type of a situation and she's going to respond in court. And of course, once she took his clothes off, I think the gig was probably up at that point. <laughs> but, but anyway, I, again, I just want to throw in there that I do think that that's a plausible story um, based on the history of the time and where they were and what they knew of the world, that that, that could definitely be something that could happen. Also, he's five foot nine, which is you and I were in Okinawa. The people there are usually under five foot. Uh, yeah. And he was like five foot nine. He's he'd be a giant to me. <laughs> yeah, like you're right about that. People often don't think about that as well. Like he is a big man. Yeah. Like anywhere, like not just in ok Okinawa had small people, but. Five foot nine at that time in history would have been fairly big anywhere in the world. Like anywhere that you went, he would have been a fairly tall person. Um, Funakoshi describes him as having terrifying presence. And he, he was tall and thin and had piercing eyes. And uh, he also said about Avitosu that he was blindingly fast and deceptively strong probably from training with the white crane. But Matsumu, uh, I think that several times, he was, uh, his presence in the room, when he came in the room, everybody stiffened up. A, yeah. bit, like, a bit like maybe Ali or a rock star or something to that effect in modern day. He was, with a small G, he was godlike. When the guards, the guards even revered him. Right. But just automatically afraid of them. Yeah. And it, I always, uh, the one thing I thought about in retrospect was how I remember how you had said, and the research shows it, that he was known in China and he was known in Japan. The Satsuma clan knew him. He trained in these different countries and he was revered everywhere that, that he went. And this was post internet, post magazines, post, right? It, his, that's just from rumor of his exploits. He was known so many places, which tells you how great he must have been as a human being and a martial artist. Well, they used to, uh, uh, the Japanese and the Chinese used to take turns invading the island on their uh, holidays, so to speak. And uh, they would make sure where he was and wouldn't go there. Yep. They, would they wouldn't go when the Japanese wouldn't go and the Chinese were there and vice versa. But uh, they also made themselves aware of Matsumura was, and they stayed away. They were afraid of him. So listen, since we're getting down to the last eight minutes of this, the time always flies on these. And again, we can do, we can do Matsumura part two, like at some point, like, you know, that's the beauty of this is we can, we can go on indefinitely. Um, but the one thing I do want to capture in this is maybe, and I don't want to lead you, like whatever you think is the important contributions of Matsumura or the most important contributions of Matsumura. And if if you could maybe frame it around, you know, today, like some of those contributions are still echoing through time into like hundreds of years later. Um so do you have any of those things that you want to talk about, Sensei, that you think are important that people should know about? Uh, yes, he was the person who systemized karate and martial arts. Um, he is everything from the past. Everything that passed, that came from the past went through him and out into the future. And that will be forever, forever. Like that's timeless until eternity comes to an end, which... Never will, right? Um, he, we're grateful to him for his students handing down, handing down the style. And we'll talk about stuff. Itosu Yasuzune, Azato, Choki Motobu, Yabu Kensu, Nabe Matsumura, Shitoko Kyan, and the father of Mazunde Karate, Gichin Fanakoshi. Right? And he passed down the Pinan, the Chanan, the Pinan Karas. Um, Naihanchis, Pesai, Seisan, Chinto, Goju Shiho, and of course, the Okinawan white grain of Akatsuru, which we use. And um, 
you know, I, I like to go back to the very beginning when he was, when um, Karate Sakugawa was at uh, a ripe age. He was, he was almost retired and possibly retired at that time. And Matsumo was 13 or 14. And um, when his father, Sofoku, brought him to the old man, they called him the old man, uh, Kenga uh, Sakugawa. And um, the old man looked at him and said, well, are you ready to dedicate the rest of your life to the art? And the words that echo to me, echo to me through time is under, understated. I shall not disappoint you. He became uh, uh, the greatest, the greatest immoral in martial arts of all time. Not the only one, but the greatest. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. You know, Sensei, one of the things that I learned from Matsumura as well, in retrospect, it's always through, like you read these stories and then you and I talk about them and then your gray matter starts to go and then you're driving in your car and you're thinking about them more was in the beginning, I used to think about say the Kata Kusanku, right? And I would think, oh, Kusanku invented that Kata and taught it to Sakugawa, right? Or Chinto would be another good example, right? The shipwreck sailor, he taught Matsumura that kata, but no, I, I, that's not what it was. It was they taught them techniques and then they invented a kata to remember the techniques that the person had shown them. And then they named it after the person to show respect to the person who had shown them those techniques that, you know, you're doing the kusanku kata. These are the kusanku techniques that I learned that I've put into this pattern so that we can pass it forward. And to me, that's genius. That's like a genius way of remembering things um, and being able to train them independently. He also was, um, he went to uh, the Shaolin in China and he trained with Iwa, Aesan, and possibly Anan, who, who they passed the Fujian white grain onto him. When he returned back to, we returned to Okinawa. He reinvented the white crane, which is the Okinawan crane, and hence the kata Akatsuri Dai, which most styles now, and I've tried to uh, made it known to a lot of style heads in Canada and the United States, and they seem to bury their heads in the sand because it was a minor part of what karate is now. And, some people, you know, when they get to learn something, they always want to be the top of everything. So they push it aside. But if people, uh, if the masters would just take a minute and have a look at the style that was formulated, again, by other masters, but the central kata and lessons are from Akatsuri Dai, that their karate would change especially the people that are third, fourth, fifth in and over, you would see your karate would change. It wouldn't be so stiff. It would become a lot softer and you would gain, and gain internal power as opposed to just physical power. When you get to be my age, it's an easier art. It's not so, it's not done, um, it's not based on pure strength, but more like Matsumura, being wise and understanding that soft is hard in martial arts, hard is soft. A lot, of that, yeah, a lot of lessons were passed down from him that are missed because people don't just don't want to be the student anymore. Yeah, and they, they want to believe that it was maybe invented by somebody closer, right? Like, in or themselves. <laughs> yeah, or themselves. And I guess we should, I, I want to mention a little bit of Sense Legacy's history here. If you, you hear him often talk about White Crane, you know, I've been training White Crane with him for a really long time now. Like, you know, I've been in martial arts 33 years and I started doing White Crane with him before I was even a black belt, luckily, because we were trying to get that built up in, in Canada. 
And Sense Legacy's history there is with Sensei Anthony Sandoval, who you've heard us talk about. But Sensei Sandoval lived in Okinawa for 18 years and sometimes unbroken for like eight or nine years at a time. And he trained with a lot of masters, but one of his primary teachers was Hohan Sokan, who's Matsumura's great grandnephew. And I don't want to get into too much of Hohan Sokan's history, Sensei, but he would be a good one for us to talk about in the future. And you know, I'll give a little teaser. He was in Argentina training, displaced from Okinawa. When he came back, um, his karate was so good that they just elevated him to a 10th then on the spot because they were all a little bit afraid of him because his martial arts was so good when he got back on the island. But Sensei has a deep, deep knowledge of White Crane from a very good direct lineage from Matsumura, an instructor who trained very deeply, Anthony Sandoval in it, and passed it along. Um, and the other thing I want to say about that is, you know, you might think, oh, since Sandoval's lived in Arizona, Kentucky, North Carolina, Minnesota, I can tell you from personal experience, since the legacy went all of those places multiple times a year, over and over again. And since Sandoval, it was not uncommon for him to be in Canada five, six times, seven times a year. Um, training with us and teaching us. So um, that may actually, some people got their nose out of joint a little bit because we kept having him here so much and going there so much. Um, this is it, Sensei, we're, we're done. It flies by so fast. Um, but we're gonna do more, like we're gonna set up more of these, we're gonna release them. And I guess as we're going out, Sensei, um, any of the events and stuff coming up that you want to talk about that people should know about the ones we're having this year that continue on every year? Um, well, we're having, of course, on February 18th, we're having our Shia. It's been running like 40 some years. What's and the name of that Shia, I said, say? Yeah. <laughs> the Matsumura Challenge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and um, we're also having a camp this year from. Uh, July the 8th to the 15th, I believe. And uh, it's going to be for, for children who will be taught at, at one level. And then I'm hoping for instructors and their black belt students. I'd like to hold a weekend of um, Matsumura Hakatsuru so that they can realize that uh, it's a, a karate is a little bit like the bow. You learn how to use wheel your bow. But you can put many ends on the bow. You can put a spear, a naginata, a ball, you know, a lot of different things. And that's what this is. Uh, the white, the Okinawan white crane is a weapon again on the end of karate. And that's why our style is unique, which uh, Randy actually named, named the legacy short. It wasn't me who named it that, but. In our style, it is intertwined with the Okinawan white crane. So that's what makes us unique and a bit different. Amazing sense. And so when we have these events, so we're having the Matsumura Challenge. Uh, another thing I always want to throw out is, you know, if you want to train with um, somebody from the Punch Kick Choke Chat, you want to reach out to us for a seminar, that would be great. If you want private lessons from Sensei Legacy, like, you know, you're an instructor and you want to delve into this, you should reach out to us. We're available to do these things and we'd be happy to do it. Um, and if you ever want to, if you're trying to figure out what events are we doing, where are we going to teach? What are we, you know, how do I reach them? We got a really good website, www.punchkickchokechat.com. If you go there, check the events page. You'll see the events that we're going to and teaching at. Also, people in our community will put their events up there as well. Like people like Sensei Copeland, his tournament is on there. You should go to that tournament. We won't put events on there that we don't feel are important for the community, martial arts community to see and at least consider going to. Um, not yet, Sensei Legacy or I or Sensei Suino or... Uh, Sensei Benson, we haven't gotten that big $200 million check yet that Joe Rogan got. Um, so, so for us, this is a labor of love. So if you the way you can help us, if you like this, you like what we're doing, 
is to just share it out. Tell your students about it. Get other people to log on, put a like, subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're on all of the platforms and all of the podcasting platforms. Um, yeah, and then send us feedback if you like something or if you don't like it, send us some feedback. We want to hear from you. It doesn't all have to be good news. Thanks, I'd say this has been great. And uh, we'll be chatting again later this afternoon. All right, given that, in the words of Max Mora, we will not disappoint.